On tonight's show, we'll tell you everything you need to know about the high-definition TV revolution and reveal Britain's best television. Plus, we'll be demonstrating for the first time push-to-talk mobile phones. Miz. Yeah. Lots. XXX. Send. You know, when SMS texting was first launched over here in 1995, some people said it would never catch on. But it did. At least it did here in Britain. Here in the States, it didn't. Not at all. Most people here haven't even heard of texting. That's because for the last 12 years, they've had something they think is much, much better. PTT. <laughs> PTT stands for push to talk. It's a function that turns your mobile phone into a worldwide walkie talkie. And it'll be available on all UK phone networks by the end of the year and most new handsets. By next Christmas, you'll be using it a lot. A lot. PTT is widely regarded as the next big thing in mobile phones. And if we take to it anywhere near as well as they have in the United States, it's right, going to be go. huge. Two-way here in America is huge. It's grown tremendously over the last few years. Matter of fact, over the last year or so, it's probably gone tenfold. It's huge with the kids, it's huge with adults, it's used for business people, and it's, uh, it's just amazing how quickly and, and far it's grown over a short period of time. Nextel, one of America's biggest mobile phone networks, have 15 million customers, 90% of whom use PTT on a regular basis, making an estimated 100 billion PTT calls on that network in one year alone. Hi, coffee please. So what's the difference between PTT and a normal mobile phone conversation? Well, you need to imagine that a mobile phone network is a massive multi-lane motorway. And every time you have a conventional mobile phone conversation, you're using up exclusively one lane. That's reserved to you. No one else can go there. PTT, on the other hand, is cleverer than that. When you speak, it shrinks your voice down into a small packet of data. And that means you can have lots and lots of PTT calls all zooming up and down the same lane on the motorway. And what that means is cheaper calls. There is no published price structuring yet, but it seems you'll either be able to subscribe at around £10 a month or pay per call at around the same price as texts. But the killer application of Push to Talk is that you're not limited to a single conversation. You can talk to as many contacts as you want simultaneously. You simply highlight the names and drag them into a group. You can have a group for your friends, a group for your family, a group for your kids. Even more impressive, you could talk to all 50 of your contacts simultaneously while each of them was standing in a different country. So, how to make a PTT call? Most of it can be accomplished using a single button. I'll give it a push. I'm given my push to talk contacts list. I've got three people in there at the moment. So I could have up to 50, but with a single glance, I can instantly see that Ewan is available, Karen's available, but James is not. I think he was at a party last night. I'll choose Ewan, and by holding down a single button, I should be able to talk to him instantly. He's actually just over there. But he could be anywhere in the world. Here we go. Hello, Ewan, are you hearing me? Over. because all of this technology is leading to just one thing. Ewan is in a very important business meeting. I push my button. <laughs> so why do Americans like PTT, or two-way as they call it, so much? In the US and Canada, we can push to talk from the East Coast to the West Coast. There's no long distance charges. You tend to say exactly what you want to say, so you're not wasting cell time by going, hey, how's it going? Not too bad. You're direct, you're to the point and it's just an immediate way of communicating with my six installers all across the country. Sounds great, but here on The Gadget Show, we wanted to find out how good PTT is for ourselves. So we borrowed these four exclusive PTT handsets from Motorola, and we've put them through a month's thorough testing. To begin with, we didn't like them yeah, very much at it? all, especially our cynical executive producer, Richard. <laughs> this is all very confusing. Bye. Jason, it's Charlotte. But then they started to grow on us. We found reasons to use them in almost every circumstance. At the shops, 
in the office, at home. John called me from France. Hello, Jason. Yes, uh, wonderful to speak to you. I'm actually not in the UK at all. And I called him from the States. Hello, John, this is Jason speaking. Can you hear me? When my plane was snowbound in Chicago and my normal mobile phone couldn't even connect, PTT put me straight through to my producer, who was able to arrange another flight to get me home. The only problem with Push to Talk as I see it is that when you're first told about it, it doesn't really seem that relevant. That is until you use it. The ability to hold down one button and talk to not just one, but loads and loads of your friends is actually really useful, but you've just got to try it to believe me. It's fair to say that I'm a complete and utter convert. And you know, once you've tried it, you will be too. Filling your MP3 player with music from CDs and the internet is easy. But what if you've got some choice tunes on vinyl? How on earth do you get LPs into an iPod? To start with, you'll need a good sound card. If you haven't got one already, don't worry. They only cost around £50 and are quick and easy to install. Then, to connect your PC to your stereo, use a stereo to phono cable that costs about £10. Now you'll need some conversion software. DB PowerAmp is free to download from the web and has an easy to understand step-by-step -step guide on inputting vinyl. And remember, make sure you set the correct recording levels by playing music out of your hi-fi so that it hits the optimal level on your PC. Finally, select the number of tracks that you'll be recording from the drop-down record menu. Give each one a name, start your LP playing and hit record. The software listens for gaps in the music, so knows when a new track has started. Each track will save as an MP3 file, which you can then burn onto CD or import onto your MP3 player. Now you can listen to your sacred vinyl collection, content in the knowledge those rare discs aren't getting worn out by a scratchy old stylus. Hello, Radio Olympia. This is direct television from the studios at Alexander Palace. Something, something is... There's a picture there. There is something, there's something different there. It looks like a face. It's a face. Tonight, we're going to save you a lot of money, making sure that the next television you buy will be the right one. Because high-definition television is just around the corner. But there's good news and bad news. The good news is that high-def picture quality is five times better than the norm. We're talking cinema standard resolution in your front room. These are the first high-def TV pictures to be transmitted across the terrestrial network. Now, obviously, you won't be able to see the difference because you're watching on standard definition, but sitting here, I can tell you that the clarity of the picture is extraordinary. On these tomatoes here, you can see every single little particle of dust and detail and the dimples here in the oranges. It's, it's just phenomenal. Slightly worrying for a TV presenter, I think, because you can see every minute imperfection. More makeup required, I think. High Def has been around for 15 years in Japan and in the States. It's a way of life. The UK is finally catching up, and you're going to be hearing a lot about it over the next 12 months. For a start, Euro 1080, the only high-definition service currently available in the UK, will be launching a second channel in May. They broadcast an eclectic mix of programmes and have just a few maverick enthusiasts as subscribers. Aimed more at the mainstream are high-def camcorders. You'll start to see more and more of these as home movie makers look to future-proof their footage. We're also on the brink of another VHS versus Betamax type of format war. Before long, you'll be able to buy movies on high-def discs. And the choice is between Blu-ray, which has more capacity, 
and HD DVD, which is cheaper to make. But the really big news is that Sky are going to start transmitting high-definition TV in the UK early next year. Now, there'll be lots of you out there who've recently spent lots of money on plasma and LCD televisions who'll be thinking, at last, high-resolution pictures that will finally do my expensive screen justice. Well, it's time for the bad news. Sky have released a statement that has gone off like a hydrogen bomb across the industry. And I've got it right here. It says, viewers who want to be certain their new plasmas or LCD will work with Sky's high definition service should make sure it has a HDMI connector. They're talking about this high definition multimedia interface or HDMI cable. It's basically a digital SCART, but if you haven't got a HDMI socket in the back of your telly, and most of them don't, then come the high def revolution, you are going to be staring at a lot of snow. There's a small concession. A DVI socket that supports content protection will do instead, although they're rare too. Your telly will also need a minimum of 720 lines and have a 50 hertz refresh rate. Those of you who've just forked out for a TV that isn't like that have every right to feel choked. This Pioneer 435 XDE costs three grand and is one of the few televisions currently available that meets the minimum specification. We reckon it's the ultimate plasma screen and really comes into its own when it's playing high quality pictures. If it's a bit too pricey, then resist the urge to become an early adopter and wait for HDMI equipped sets to come down in price. However, if your telly has just gone kaput and you simply must have a replacement now, then stick around. Later, we'll be testing some televisions to see which offers the best standard definition picture available today. Now it's time to meet a new face on The Gadget Show. This is Spencer Kelly. He's a computer scientist, and while most of us only want to know what our gadgets do, he knows how they do it, and he's here to tell us. This week, internet security. We're buying more and more stuff online nowadays, and that means we have to send more and more of our sensitive credit card information across the web. Now, we can't just send these details as is, because you never know who's going to be watching. So what we do instead is encode these details. Think of it like this. This padlock is a computer program which encodes the data. This key is a different computer program that decodes it at the other end. So all we have to do, if I want to send my credit card across the net, is to stick it in the box and lock it with my padlock. Take the key out, and then I can send my credit card to anyone I want. Doesn't matter if it's intercepted on the way, because it's coded and no one, apart from my key, can unlock the information. Eventually, it makes its way to the internet shop. My credit card details have arrived safe and sound. Now, there's one thing left to do. I've somehow got to send my key to the internet shop without it being intercepted. It works like this. The internet shop sends me a box and also their padlock. It's open and it doesn't have a key. They keep hold of the key. So I lock my key inside their box. I use their open padlock to safely lock my key away. I can't open it, no one can open it. Only the internet shop has the key. So now I can safely send my locked key across the net. Again, it doesn't matter who intercepts it on the way, it's locked. Only the internet shop can open it. Eventually, the box reaches the internet shop. They use their key to unlock their padlock, which releases my key to unlock my padlock. Hey presto, my credit card details have arrived safe and sound. So whenever you're imparting sensitive information on the web, make sure you can see a picture of a padlock in the bottom of your internet browser. Then you know the encryption is at work and you can buy with confidence. Did you know Microsoft's Internet Explorer is not the only way to surf the net? 
there are other free web browsers that are potentially quicker and more secure. Here's our download expert, Tom Dunmore, with the lowdown on a couple of his favourites. First up is Firefox, which is based on Netscape Navigator, which back in the 90s was the biggest browser in the world. So it's got quite a pedigree. One of the first things you'll notice in terms of its difference from Internet Explorer is this tabbed browsing. Uh, basically, this allows you to open a number of pages in the same window. For example, I can check my webmail, uh, do some work, some research, and keep an eye on an eBay auction without having to flick through pages or wait for things to reload. But it's not the only feature that makes Firefox more functional. One of my favourites is RSS feeds. And the idea is that news websites can send their headlines direct to the toolbar of your browsers. It's not just your, your big news sites like BBC that do it, it's also a lot of niche interest sites. Another neat time-saving feature is the integrated search. Uh, this is a box in the top right-hand corner of the browser that allows you to directly search Google. So if I type in, say, Star Wars, I can find all about the new Star Wars films on Google. But what's unique about Firefox is you can also search a lot of different search engines. Um, so I could go to Yahoo or find out what products were available at Amazon.com. Another alternative to Internet Explorer is Opera. Now, Opera shares a lot of the same features as Firefox. For example, as you can see here, there's tabbed browsing. And it also has the RSS feature as well. But the real killer feature of Opera is the ability to zoom in and out of pages. Zooming is a useful feature on a PC, but it becomes really useful uh, when you run Opera on something like this, a Sony Ericsson P910. This has a relatively small screen and obviously trying to look at websites the text is very small and hard to read. With Opera you can zoom in on the text, read it easily and then zoom out to get a feel of the website and it becomes a much more natural experience. Opera is available for a range of devices like this. Some of them come with it pre-installed. With other ones you just need to download it to a PC, hook your phone up and transfer it across. But ultimately, the only way to find out which browser is for you is to give them a try. Today we are able to show television on screens large enough to be shown to a cinema audience and have recently been able to send wireless television pictures in colour. Getting a good TV picture doesn't necessarily mean buying the most expensive set. Fiddling with the menus is free and can make a big improvement to your picture. Here's our guide. Step one is to turn all the colour off. Step two is to tweak the brightness until the black areas are just on the edge of blackness. You want all the greyness to just disappear. Step three is to adjust the contrast so you've got a good compromise between detail in the dark areas and detail in the bright areas. Finally, step four is to dial the colour back in until the flesh tones look natural. And hey presto, perfect picture. The trouble with tellies though is that they wear out, so sometimes there's no choice but to get a new one. We have here a selection of the latest models that have been well reviewed in the specialist press, but which offers the best standard definition picture? We've been sitting in front of them for a week Traditional cathode ray tubes, plasma, three grand LCDs, even one with backlighting that supposedly relaxes the eye to help you perceive more detail. We were particularly interested in Tony and Robin's opinion, a professional editor and cameraman respectively. They help make the pictures of this programme. Well, you shot it so you should know what it looks like. <laughs> it was OK leaving me. <laughs> it didn't look like that in the edit suite either. <laughs> Good. OK, OK. Nobody in the world is better qualified to tell us which telly is best, and it wasn't going to be Tiny's thousand-pound plasma. Well, it's clearly the worst one here from a picture quality point of view, easily. But um, I suppose if you must have a big one, and it's only thousand pounds, it's pretty good, isn't it? Our experts weren't impressed by the LCD televisions from Philips or Toshiba either. You're not seeing nice textures across the across your face, for instance, there right. on that on that image. You can see it's kind of in blocks. It's like in stripes. Mm -hmm. you, so you don't get a smooth gradation. You get you get banding is the technical word. 
even this £1,700 set by Panasonic, hailed by one magazine as simply the best, didn't get our boys excited. It doesn't blow me away as being the most stunning picture I've ever seen. It isn't that sharp, the contrast, the definition isn't that, that good. I don't... The winner was clear, and a tenth of the price of some rivals. Stunning. Yeah, very good. It's an excellent picture, though. My favourite, the bunch. Without a doubt. Would you be surprised that I've told you you could get one for £350? A, a steal at that price, yeah. yeah. Without a doubt, it's the best picture here. The Panasonic TX28. It may be the cheapest set here and an old-fashioned CRT, but we'd recommend it without hesitation. This week on The Gadget Show, I visit the biggest gadget exhibition in the world. Susie's. Recently, we went to London's Excel Centre for a look at some of the amazing new technology that'll soon be coming to.